So now let's talk about uh, a different situation, uh, a liquidation situation. So we've just been through an example where uh, the ether actually appreciated, went up in value. So now let's look at a different uh, scenario. So in this scenario, um, ether depreciates by 25%. So that means that the ether goes from $200 to 150. And let's kind of go through the mechanics of what would happen uh, at 150 uh, value. So now uh, we've minted uh, 500 and the, the total value of what we've got here is only 750. So the over collateralization is 250. Okay, and that's right at the edge. That is exactly a collateralization ratio of uh, 1.5. So very dangerous uh, to be at that point because just a, a, like a 1% or even less uh, further depreciation in uh, ETH means that the contract is going to be uh, closed out. So, so this is uh, a scenario where some action might need to be uh, taken. So, so let's kind of assume, um, again, that the ETH drops uh, 25% from 200 to 150. And, uh, and the vault holder has got a number of possible options. So the first option, which is analogous to what you would do with the margin call, is just to add some more collateral. So you could add, let's say, one ETH to, uh, to the vault. And then you'd be fine, you'd be above the 1.5. So the second option is you've got the 500 die, you could just pay back the loan and, and retrieve the five uh, ETH that you put in originally. And the third option is that the loan could be liquidated by a keeper. So as soon as you go just a little bit uh, below uh, that 1.5 collateralization ratio, that's going to happen and it's going to happen very quickly. And that is the job of the keeper that we spent a lot of time talking about in the second course, uh, DeFi uh, primitives. So the keeper is an external actor that's incented to actually do a uh, liquidation. So, so let's actually go through a liquidation at the 1.5 or think of it as 1.49, um, but let's just uh, go through what a liquidation would actually look like. So the mechanics are uh, the following. So the keeper is actually going to uh, into the vault and to liquidate 3.33 ETH. And essentially what, um, what's happening here is that those ETH are auctioned off and that will generate enough money to pay off the loan of 500. Okay, so that's the first thing that the keeper uh, does. So the keeper also gets a fee for actually doing that. So the keeper is incented uh, to do this action, to do the liquidation, to keep the protocol uh, strong uh, and efficient. So the keeper is going to keep uh, 0.2. So what about the vault holder? So the vault holder ends up with 1.47 uh, ETH. That's what's left over after paying off the loan and then the fee uh, for the keeper. So they get 1.47 ETH, which is worth $220. And of course, they've got the original uh, 500 uh, die. So overall, what they get is 720. Okay, so, so let's kind of think about that. It's interesting. So they've got 720. If they didn't go through any of this, if they just had their five uh, ETH, or if they decided to pay back uh, the loan and pull out the five ETH, then the five ETH would be worth 750. Okay, so this is a situation where the loan is over collateralized, the loan is paid back, 
and any residual minus the fee to the keeper goes back uh, to the person that, uh, that made the original deposit uh, of the five uh, ETH. Okay, so this is, uh, this is how uh, a liquidation actually uh, works. So there's another layer that's very interesting here in terms of kind of the stabilization of DAI. So, so why would a DAI be worth a dollar? Well, the most obvious reason is that it is over collateralized. So uh, people believe it's worth a dollar because it's more than a dollar in collateral. And we know the collateral is risky, so we know it's over collateralized. And, and anybody can see the degree of over collateralization. Again, on the Ethereum blockchain, everything is transparent. So the other thing is kind of interesting is there's another stability force that's linked to market actions. So in the liquidation, um, what actually happens here? So the keeper goes in and you remember they sell 3.33 uh, uh, ETH. So you're selling ETH in the market and die are purchased. Okay, so this actually exerts a positive price pressure on DAI. So you can think of the overall scenario here is that the value of the collateral is going down. And people might think, well, maybe uh, if it goes down enough, we're not going to have as much confidence that DAI is worth a dollar. Uh, as that collateral gets lower and lower, people will start to discount uh, the DAI. So maybe it's 99, maybe it's 0.98. But with this liquidation, given that you're selling ETH and buying DAI, uh, that actually uh, acts as a counterbalance. So there are two levels um, that actually build in uh, for uh, the stability. So a very uh, interesting uh, mechanism. Okay, so of course, the key idea here is to maintain uh, the peg. Okay, so uh, a stable coin, uh, you want to be uh, as, as stable as possible with respect to uh, the pegged asset. So ideally, you'd like it at exactly $1 all the time. Uh, there will be some fluctuations, 0.995, uh, uh, 1.01, .01, but ideally you want to maintain uh, that one-to-one uh, -one, uh, peg. So there's, again, various different mechanisms here that are in play in this protocol, and we're going to talk about uh, like a number of them here. So, so one um, is a, a die savings rate. We've got a debt ceiling. We've got a stability fee. And these are parameters that are controlled in the smart contract by the governance of MakerDAO. And the governance is the Maker token, MKR. Okay, so uh, it is in the governance best interest to keep uh, the die as close as possible uh, to the US dollar. So um, the stability fee, is basically uh, a variable interest rate uh, that's paid in DAI uh, by vault holders on any debt that they generate. Okay, so this is, think of it as an interest rate. So this interest rate can be raised or lowered, and this will basically uh, incentivize, for example, the repayment of the DAI. Okay, so if the rate goes up, then you're going to repay. And this will basically drive uh, the price towards uh, the peg. So um, the stability fees, um, and, you know, fund uh, the die uh, savings rate, and uh, this is a variable rate that any die holder uh, can earn on their die deposit. So if you've got die, you can actually deposit and uh, earn this variable rate. So this die savings rate is compounded uh, on a per block basis. 
which is kind of interesting also because the block happens every, let's say, 18 seconds. Okay, so it's near continuous uh, compounding. And the stability fee uh, is always greater uh, or equal to the savings rate. And that is enforced by the smart contract. Okay, so that is also uh, very important. And we'll talk about this uh, later with some other protocols that this makes a lot of sense that the savings rate has to be less than the, the revenue coming in uh, to actually fund it. There's also uh, a die debt ceiling. Uh, and this is, uh, again, contract enforced. It, it is uh, a parameter that's agreed upon that could actually vary through time. Uh, and, and just let me emphasize this. Uh, the, the fundamental nature of the contract, uh, it is set in stone, but there are certain parameters that can be varied by the governance. And that's what we're talking about uh, right now. So this is uh, basically the amount of debt uh, is got a ceiling. And uh, this basically uh, allows for more or less supply uh, to meet um, the current level of, uh, of demand. And if, uh, if you're at the debt ceiling, then basically it's not possible to mint some more dot. So you're at the ceiling for debt, then uh, people cannot go in and deposit more collateral and, and mint uh, some more dye. Okay, so we have to wait until some of the old debt is paid. So this is our paid off. So this is another uh, mechanism for uh, stability. So there's also um, liquidation uh, issues. So when the position, as I showed you, goes uh, under um, the, uh, the collateralization uh, ratio, there will be uh, a liquidation. And uh, there is a liquidation penalty, and that penalty is calculated as a percentage of the debt and is deducted from the collateral. So again, this is just one additional uh, mechanism that we look at. So this all makes sense, but the collateral is still very risky. So even with a collateralization ratio of 1.5 or 2.0, it is possible that there could be like a huge drop in the value of the collateral. And we've seen this historically. So in the crypto space, uh, at the end of 2017, um, cryptos lost you know, 80% of their value, which would challenge uh, the collateralization uh, ratio. So what happens if there is a sharp drop in the crypto and, and basically there's just not enough collateral to pay back uh, the debt? Okay, so that's, uh, that's something that we need to worry about. And, and essentially, what the DAI uh, system has done is to create a second layer of risk management. And this has to do with uh, protocol uh, debt. So there's going to be a, a buffer pool that uh, is going to be helpful in a situation where there's an extreme event and uh, we go into a situation of under collateralization. Okay, so, so that's kind of the second layer of risk management is uh, this buffer pool. And, um, and, and ideally, there's enough uh, funds in this buffer uh, to actually cover the under collateralization. So um, there's actually more. There's a third level. And the third level is, well, what happens if you run out of the buffer, you're under collateralized, and you still um, need to pay back the debt? And the way that that happens is with the governance of the MakerDAO. 